Good evening. It's lovely to see so many of you here, although the lights are dark there, so I can't really see you. <laughs> and uh, Deborah, welcome to the Bay Area. Thank you. It's a <coughs> pleasure being here. And I should say that this is uh, being live streamed, so it would be remiss of me not to uh, acknowledge the fact that uh, I have friends and relatives in Melbourne who are watching this, and since it's one o'clock tomorrow afternoon there, I say <laughs> g'day. <laughs> You know, sadly, we live in a time when those of us who write on anti-Semitism basically wake up in the morning to learn that what we've written is not like the rest of the history that we write. It's sort of out of date. Um, it was mentioned in the introduction that uh, I have a history of the Jews, and it, it, it's just come out in its third edition. And in that, I have a long section on contemporary anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism in the age of Trump. Uh, and even though it just came out a couple of months ago, the manuscript went to the publisher before Pittsburgh. So it's already out of date. In your case, your book has just come out a couple of weeks ago. So it too missed Pittsburgh. It also missed Representative Jim Jordan of Ohio tweeting Tom Steyer's name using a dollar sign, it's the S. Ilan Omar, twice. The Yellow Jacket movement and the attack on Alain Finkelkart the recent defection of senior members of the British Labour Party. And just today's two headlines. I woke up to read the foreword this morning. It's not your imagination. The Nazi swastika is trendy among teens. And then, of course, the Democrats hate Jewish people from Trump. So none of these incidents were able to make it into, no. <laughs> into the book. And tomorrow morning, there'll be more. So I say this just to illustrate that there could not be a more apt title for your book than anti-Semitism here and now. And for a historian, it's just impossible to keep up, absolutely impossible. And that leads me to my first question. Uh, it's sort of an inside baseball question for historians, but it won't alienate the audience, I can assure you. You're a historian, you've written on the history of anti-Semitism. And this new book, however, is principally focused on anti-Semitism today. How was it for you to write a book on a subject that you've only previously treated from afar in a chronological sense. What were your emotions like uh, writing about anti-Semitism in the present as opposed to the past? Was it harder? Was it easier? What it did you feel? It was hard. It was very hard. Um, and it goes uh, in the introduction. I write. I say it right at the outset that I found this bar book incredibly hard to write. And I didn't know why. Um, and then it suddenly dawned on me that everything I write, even when I wrote about Holocaust deniers, I was discussing how they treat history. So everything before this, all that I wrote about had already happened. We could differ on interpretations. You could take one, I could take another, whatever. But, but it already was in the past. Here I was dealing with the present. So that made it hard to write. It also made it hard to write because even though I miss Pittsburgh, you know, I sent the manuscript in the first week in September and Pittsburgh was the end of October, there were things happening every day. Uh, as you know, when you get a copy edited manuscript back from your editor, the, the expectation is you're not gonna add very much, you'll check here, you may add a sentence, you may make minor changes. They can charge you for it. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, thank God the Knopf <laughs> didn't do that, but um, I, I, wrote, I called my editor and I said, look, we've had a Holocaust survivor murdered in her apartment in Paris. Mm -hmm. We've had more stuff with Corbyn in the UK. We've had the Polish Holocaust law and the changes and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu's working with the Poles and we've had Viktor Orban in Hungary. I said, I have to put all these things in. So she let me do that. And finally she called me and she said, Deborah, if we don't have this book, if we don't have the manuscript within the next week, it's not gonna get out in time. It's already in the catalog. Our salespeople are you know, promoting it, et cetera. So right before I uh, sent it off, I added the following line to the end of the introduction. And I said, um, I don't usually, I, I'm a historian, I deal in the past, as do you. Um, and I don't usually engage in predictions. You know, I leave that to sociologists. And the only way they get away with it is nobody remembers what they predicted. So <laughs> uh, some of my best friends are sociologists. So. Um, 
But um, I said, I'm willing to predict that by the time this book appears, something will have happened that I should have been included. And then came Pittsburgh, and now comes all that other stuff. So a long answer to your question was, there was an immediacy to all this that was mind boggling. Yeah. That was really, um, it, it, it was just how do you, how do you express it? And I try, as, as you can tell from having read the book, to keep a, a still small voice. I didn't want to get hysterical, but sometimes it was hard to do. I was just gonna say the book is written with great passion, but the passion um, never exceeds, let alone overwhelms the, the moderation that you show in the book. It's an extremely, uh, you keep it in check. Uh, Thank you, I work In ways that I envy, I have to say. <laughs> it was hard to do, but um, the information, the facts are so outrageous that I didn't have to overlay myself and say, oh, this is outrageous. If someone couldn't figure out that what I was describing was outrageous, then my saying it was outrageous wouldn't have helped. You know? Right, right, right. Um, so this is a book about anti-Semitism and you do something very interesting in the beginning and you take the time to talk about the spelling of the word. Um, and that, uh, that is a serious issue for those of you who don't know and maybe you could explain that okay, to the it's, audience. It's, 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 it's an issue that historians such as John and myself and a couple of others, you know, we can have long discussions about it. But the word has its origins in the end of the 19th century in Austria, a writer, a journalist, Wilhelm Marr, um, was looking for a word, he was an overt anti-Semite, and he was looking for a word that would uh, describe the Jew as essentially different, a unique being, evil unique being, um, and he didn't want the word Judenhaus, Jewish hatred, um, because he wanted something broader. He wanted something that would encompass, encompass people who were uh, not religious, who had moved away from the Jewish community, whatever it was. So he came up with this word antisemitismus, anti-Semitism. Um, and the reason he picked se uh, the word Semite is this was the same time that uh, a French anthropologist was doing work on language groupings and was looking at Romance language, Slavic language, Semitic languages, so he used that as his way of encompassing. But he was, it was all about, it was about Jews. That was the only group he was writing about, the only group was hatred, he, toward whom he was expressing hatred. As, as a footnote, as you well know, um, he recanted on his deathbed, uh, and he said, no, it wasn't the Jews, it was the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> The horse had left the barn by then, you know, it was a little too late. Um, but it, and, and it was written as one word. And at some point when it was public, when his articles were published in uh, the United Kingdom, a, we think it was a printer, just who was setting the type setting, who put in a hyphen. No. And capitalized Semitism, so it became anti-Semitism distorting what the word is, because you'll have people saying, well, I'm a Semite, I can't be an anti-Semite. Of course, someone who is of a group can be a, a hater of that group, we know that. Um, and then, this is, so that, so many historians, I'm sure, I don't know what you do, but I have written it as one word. One word. One word, for, for I wasn't the first one to do that at all. But then I do write it with a lowercase a, because something which has caused such misery to so many people, my people, but, but so countless numbers of people, doesn't deserve a capital letter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So if next time you write the word, just You no, have to no fight hyphen. your spell check. You have to fight your yes, spell check. Yes, your spell check will put a hyphen in. Absolutely, <laughs> how much time I've wasted going backwards and rubbing it out. Um, so that's anti-Semitism. Um, and most of us in the room, think we know what an anti-Semite is, of course. Um, you know, the British philosopher Isaiah Berlin said, um, an anti-Semite is someone who hates Jews more than is absolutely necessary. Um, but that's not, and he was Jewish, mm -hmm. but that's not a great working definition. It's, no. it's, it's witty in but an Oxford has, Don kind of way. Right, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. right. But it has its, its wisdom. It has its wisdom. 
you know, if, uh, let's put it in the context of racism. Um, I'm driving home on the highway, mm. and along comes a driver and forces me off the road. In a very aggressive manner, the car flips over, I almost could get killed, and I go home, I get home, finally I get home, and I'm completely shaken, and the people in the house say to me, what's wrong? And I say, somebody did this to me, and I almost got killed. That's one description, but if I say a black driver did this to me, that's racism, because right. the black is irrelevant. If a police officer sees what happens and pulls up and says, give me a description of the, of the driver, and I say to her, well, he was a young man, he was this, he was that, he was African American, he was black, that's not. So I think that's what, what in that description is being said. If you want you know, uh, 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 to hate someone, hate them for what they did and not adding that element of, right. of being a Jew. Yeah. Um, as far as the structure of the book is concerned, for those who, who haven't yet had a chance to, to read it, and I recommend that you all do, uh, Deborah employs um, a venerable literary tradition, and that is the epistolary exchange. This is a, a set of, you know, an exchange of letters. And you have these fictitious interlocutors. Uh, Abigail is a, a Jewish undergraduate. And Joe is a non-Jewish professor in the law school at your right. university. And uh, they represent the perplexed, and you're their guide, <laughs> right, in this generation. Um, so that's how the book is set out. It's a series of, series of letters. You know, over the last, or however many years it is, many years, you and I attend things like uh, symposia, conferences, give lectures mm -hmm. on anti-Semitism at uh, universities, um, at Jewish community centers and things like that. And for the longest time, they tended to focus on America's jury's principal concerns um, were on anti-Semitism either in contemporary Europe or in the past. It was rarely about Here. homegrown. That's changed now. That's changed now. The um, Southern Poverty Law Center uh, in, did a count in 2016 and declared that there were 917 hate groups active in the United States. And the Southern Poverty Law Center, interestingly, uh, categorizes groups, hate groups, by type. There are anti-immigrant ones, anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, etc. However, there's no category for anti-Semitic groups. And a reporter asked one of the um, senior fellows at the center why that was the case. And he said, the reason we don't have a separate category for anti-Jewish groups is that the vast majority of hate groups are all anti-Semitic. Anti exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, but people sometimes, you know, um, hear the term white supremacist, white nationalist, which is clearly racist. We don't even have to belabor that point. There's no question about it. But it is also anti-Semitic. I mean, and in its, in its essence, I mean, think about Charlottesville. When those young men dressed like they had come out of a Brooks Brother or maybe J. Crew catalog with yep. their khakis and their polo shirts, on purpose, on purpose, so they would look very respectable, were marching across that campus chanting, Jews will not replace us. <coughs> what did they mean by that? What the, first of all, there's a concept uh, in, in, in history of replacement theory that you know Christianity came to replace Jews, it's, but that, so they were, Picking up on that a little, but what they were really saying is, if I lose my job to an African American or a brown person or Latino or Latina, um, or one becomes president of the United States, um, they were not smart enough to get there on their own. This is the marchers talking, obviously. I always get nervous. Someone may have just turned on, tuned in right now and saying. <laughs> Who was that woman saying those things? Um, who's behind them? Who's doing this? There's someone smarter than they are. They're not smart enough to do that. Remember, the racist punches down. The, uh, 
I gotta keep those people away from me because they're gonna bring down the gene pool. The anti-Semite punches up. The Jew is smarter, the Jew is conniving, the Jew is craftier, you never can tell with the Jews, he's a Soros, he's a Rothschild, et cetera. Um, so that Jews will not replace us, Jews are manipulating behind the scenes getting those people into the jobs, into replacing us. And that's, that's part of what this is all about. Yeah, I mean, the ostensible reason for the march had to do with the taking down of the ostensible, Civil War statues. Right, right. And of course, if you go to, it's an occupational hazard, but if you go to these alt-right websites, you'll see who was actually behind the taking down, right. purportedly, of the statues, and it was Jews. Right. That's also right. part That's of right. the thing. That's right. They're orchestrating absolutely everything. All these alt-right websites are principally, we hear a lot about anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim, but they are all at the root of everything. Who is, is who is making this happen? Well, think about the guy in Pittsburgh. Yeah. What was he yelling as the SWAT team was bringing him down? You know, you're not going to bring down the white race. You know, that's the irony. In the far in the eyes of the far right, we're not white. Right. In the eyes of the that's, left, we talk are. About but, that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Can't we can't get a break? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was something. There was obviously something um, qualitatively different about Charlottesville. Um, can you place Charlottesville in a larger perspective for Charlottesville us? was so open about its hatred. Yeah. And I think, and then of course it was compounded by two things. The terrible murder of the, of the young woman uh, by the guy who drove his car right into the, into the center of the demonstrators, and you have those horrible pictures of people flying in the air. And then our president's um, comment, nice people on both sides. Well, I'm sorry, nice people don't march chanting, Jews will not replace us. Nice people don't march, don't drive their cars into protesters. Um, and I think, so I think those two things really jumped out at people. But also, it was more than that. And as a historian, as you do all the time, and as I do, we contextualize things. Yeah. And Charlottesville came after the campaign, and then a, well into the, or a couple of months into the presidency of, of this most recent presidency, um, the current presidency, and there's been such hatred that's come out left and right, but there's been that the hatred and the, and the filters are down. You know, the attack, political correctness can go too far. There's no mm -hmm. question about it. But, but often political correctness means I don't say things that are awful about you, to you, in front of you, or to others. Right. And, and, and those things have moved aside, so I can say whatever I want, do whatever I want the growth industry, industry of the swastika, et cetera. So Charlottesville was this graphic illustration of something that so many of us felt was brewing before it, mm, and, and it's gotten worse since. Yeah. Um, I was struck by a couple of things at Charlottesville. One was, of course, they showed, the f you know, the news showed ad nauseum the marches saying Jews will not replace us, and left it completely unanalyzed. Yes. They didn't, they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know what to do with it. They didn't even bother talking about it. They just mm -hmm. showed it and then, and then, and then moved on. Um, it was also a Friday night and there was a synagogue That's full right, of that. worshippers that was completely surrounded by these torch-bearing neo-Nazis. That, that never made the news at all. It made the JT, it made the Jewish the Jewish, The Jewish press. Other it, than not only were, the, was the, were there guys who positioned themselves outside with, with guns open, because it's an open carry state, yeah. um, but the Jews who were inside, I think it was a Shabbat, Shabbat morning, yeah. um, the, the rabbi looked outside and said, we're not going out the front door. He had the people go out the back door to their cars in groups, small groups, and he had them take the Sifrei Torah with them. And I wept, that's when I wept. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, this was before the young woman was killed, but when I heard that report or read it in the JTA, um, I don't know of any other time in American Jewish history when Jews had to sneak out of a synagogue. And that was very, very telling. 
And I think, and you're right, That's you're right, the general reporting did not pick up on it. Did not pick up didn't on it. Didn't pick up on it. And I think that one of the reasons they didn't pick up on it, and you've just touched on it a moment ago, but I want to get back to it because it's mm -hmm. an incredibly important thing. It's the term white nationalism itself and the problems that, that, that it, it causes for Jews. For the left, the term precludes Jews because they are seen as white. And by contrast, the right does not see uh, Jews as white at all. Last spring semester at a whole lot of universities, uh, particularly in the South, but not only in the South, uh, there were posters put up on campuses across, across the United States that screamed, white man, the Jews are taking your, and then you can mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Right. They do not see Jews as white. That's right. And uh, since they're the enemy, <laughs> as it were, and they pose a real danger, um, their definition should be taken very, very seriously, of course. Uh, but it also, because the left progressives see Jews as white, it makes it very hard to find allies now, increasingly so, in you know, in, a, in any form of sort of anti-Nazi well, alliance. We're seeing that, we've seen that every day, you know. I think it's important to understand that for many people on the progressive left, you see this in Jeremy Corbyn's um, Labour Party in, in the UK, you see it in the United States, we see it with some of our representatives. There, for, for people in that sector of the progressive left, their view of prejudice is refracted through a prism. And if you remember from your high school physics, a prism shape bends light. And that prism has two facets. Some of you may have heard me say this this morning on NPR. That prism has two facets, a ethnic facet and a class facet. And you, they look at Jews and they see someone who is not of an ethnic minority and they see someone who is privileged, even though many Jews are not privileged, but they see someone who is privileged. Then, and, and someone who, is, not, who is, is white and is privileged could not be a victim of prejudice. Then you add to that, they look at themselves, as Jeremy Corbyn looks at it himself, he always likes to say, my mother marched at Milk, was at the Milk Street demonstration, that was the anti-fascist demonstrations in the 30s in London. Um, they look at themselves and they say, moi? You know, to quote that great philosopher, Miss Piggy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and they say, I absorbed liberal progressive principles with my mother's milk. I have them in my very being. How is, it's impossible for me to be a purveyor of prejudice. So these people who could not possibly be victims of prejudice are accusing me, who could not possibly be a purveyor of prejudice, of being prejudiced. Something is out of whack. Ipso facto, they must be doing this for some ulterior motive, and often that ulterior motive becomes, oh, they're only doing it because I support the Palestinians, because mm -hmm. I, do, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I don't like Israel, whatever it might be. Um, but, but that puts Jews in the middle. And I was just talking to uh, a Hillel director at a very prominent university where I'm going soon to speak, not at the invitation of Hillel or of Jewish studies, but of the president and the provost. And so I just, she was on the conference call when they were briefing me about the talk and who was coming mm. and what was going on there. And she said that many of the students active in the Hillel would like to be active in other progressive uh, activities, some having to do with w aligning with other minorities, some having to do with the environment, with date rape, whatever it is. But many of these groups on the left um, sort of demand of Jewish students what I call, uh, a, it's McCarthyism of the left. Um, a, you know, do you support Israel? Are you a member of Hillel? Are you active in Hillel? And if you say no to any of, to all those things, then you can be part of it. So it leaves you in this limbo 
But increasingly, students are asked even a more basic question, and that is, are you, are Jew you Jewish? Jewish, yes, that's right. That's right. Because the assumption is then they cannot be... If you're Jewish, be... you could not be, you could not understand, you could not be part of an anti-prejudice effort, an anti-discrimination effort. In fact, in many of these, uh, when they put together, we are against, you know, homophobia, misogyny, Islamophobia, they won't include Jews. They, they don't. They don't include Jews. That's the irony of this whole, I mean, I don't know if it's on your list of questions, but I'm going to answer it anyway now. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, You've already preempted about five of them, so oh, it's, okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, have a good day. You know, yeah, good yeah, day yeah, to yeah. all you people in Melbourne, right? Um, that's the irony of this whole debate over this resolution. When some of the originators of the National Women's March, and by the way, the, the efforts of the march and the objectives of the march, I'm a, 120% behind it was the leadership that, that alienated me and, and made me step back. Um, but when they were putting together the original founding principles, and they were talking about women who have been subject to discrimination, uh, gay women, black women, uh, Latino women, et cetera, et cetera, transgender, um, they wouldn't include Jews. Because how could you, going back to what I said about, how can you possibly be victims? So here we have an incident where there is open anti-Semitism, whether intended or not, uh, by a rep member of the House of Representatives. Um, and when there is a proposal to condemn it, suddenly then everything else gets tacked on, you know? And, and it took me back to thinking about, um, Ferguson and when the Black Lives Matter movement started. And when it first started, I'll, I'll admit this, you know, when it first started, I was thinking, well, look, all lives matter. Why, we, why this emphasis on Black Lives Matter? But if, over the course of time, I realized that I was wrong because this was coming to address a very real problem right. affecting the black community, a very real problem, a very pressing problem. They were, the black community was victims, but affecting the whole United States, but certainly the black community. And so it was black lives matter. But when it's Jews, then you have to glomp on everything else. I still, if I had been there, I would have voted for the resolution because I wouldn't vote against something like that. But it, it, it it became very watered down in its meaning. You know, it's not dissimilar, and you as a historian of this field know this well also, sometimes when I'm speaking about the Holocaust, yeah. someone will stand up and you can see they're angry, you know, and they can say, I'm so tired of hearing about the Holocaust, why don't we hear more about the Armenian genocide or the genocide of the Tutsis in Rwanda? And I'll look at the person and I'll say, you're right. We should hear more about it. If I were a scholar of the Armenian genocide or a scholar of the Rwanda genocide, I would be talking about it, but I'm not. You know, it's as if the, it's this anger at Jews for, for getting this attention because you're privileged, you're white. What are you, what are you, you know, carping about? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things, actually, it's the afterlife, actually, of the Shoah. One of the, one of the features, of the many features of the afterlife of the Shoah is the, the nature of Jewish society. One of the things, of course, that made it, that I believe made it unique, is that this was the first, uh, and to a great extent, sort of only middle class group to have suffered genocide That's in right. the way they did. And their children thereafter produced an inordinate number of scholars, of filmmakers, of writers, of poets, of painters, etc., etc. So there's just an entire archive that's been created of testimony, of witness, mm -hmm. uh, of recording, of history that's being written that hasn't been the case with other groups. So this is not to create a pecking order, by no, me, no, but there's an, there is a sociological, if I can, if I can give them one bit of... Uh, uh, I told you some of my best friends. One are so bit of covered, you know. Yeah, <laughs> there's, is is that there's a there is a sociological reason for why there has been such a production. That's right. Of uh, Holocaust research. To a certain extent, you have that with the Armenian genocide, uh, but of course, the Armenian genocide. The tragedy is that the the Turks 
still deny that it happened exactly. and sit on so many of the documents. But, but you're right, usually genocide is committed against the people who are weaker, who are less positioned in society, who are uh, lower uh, economically of a lower class. This was the first time you had a middle, upper middle uh, class that was, that was wiped out in, in that right. sense. Um, let me ask you something that you sort of touch on in the book, but I want to ask this as mm -hmm. sort of as uh, one Jewish historian to another. Um, one of the things that, that Jewish historians will have to reckon with later on um, is the enormous support that Trump has received and continues to receive from religious Jews, from the, you know from the Orthodox community. Uh, and that's perhaps, for me, I mean, you know, one of the most disturbing aspects of his rise to power. I mean, he also received support from, you know, secular Jews, the Republican Jewish coalition, but it's different. And one of the reasons it's different because, and what's baffling about religious Jews is that um, they are not naive when it comes to anti-Semitism. Um, I was struck watching like everybody else glued to the TV after Pittsburgh and the sheer number of Jewish talking heads, journalists who came on TV who actually admitted, I couldn't believe that this could happen or I didn't think, they just expressed their shock that there was, that there was anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. that yeah. there was anti-Semitism. The ultra-Orthodox group that votes for Trump are not naive in that respect. They, they know it. They, they know it, their antennae are up. Um, you might say that members of the Republican Jewish coalition uh, aren't aware of it because they're just secular Jews who believe like some of these liberal journalists also that it just, that it just couldn't happen. And that's not true. So do you have, maybe it's too early to tell, but do you have some kind of an explanation well, for Well, first for of all, I want to be careful. You know, some of you may know that until last week I was a member of an Orthodox synagogue. Uh, I resigned from that synagogue, even though the rabbi agreed with m my position, but because it's a young Israel, and even though I'm not Orthodox, yeah. uh, it's, it's close to my home. It's a wonderful synagogue, a wonderful group of people, very, a, a community. If anything bad is going to happen to you, you want to be part of that community because they will step up in a magnificent way. Um, but the National Council of Young Israel had um, defended Prime Minister Netanyahu's promise to the, uh, to the Kahanis that if he formed a government, they would be part of it. And um, my rabbi immediately uh, put on Facebook and tweeted, not my Judaism, not in my name, not in my congregation's mm -hmm. name. Um, but I still felt, because in this book I say we have to speak out that I had to speak out. And I wrote him this letter, I put it on Facebook, little did I think it would, it would go viral. Um, but there are many people in that synagogue who are not Trumpist, but I think right. there is a segment of the Jewish community um, which you very rightfully say is very aware of anti-Semitism. They're not naive, they're not thinking, oh my God, it could happen. You know, they, we've had a guard in front of our synagogue for a long time before Pittsburgh. Um, I think to some degree, it's a feeling of having been burned by the left. The, the sense of having, you know, that this is where many of them grew up, this was the home, this was the home for their parents, this was the effort, you fought on behalf of civil rights, you fought on behalf of uh, liberal ideas. And they, I think to a certain extent, feel that they've gotten burnt by uh, the tolerance, what they perceive of as the tolerance of anti-Semitism on the left. I also think that certainly in um, the modern Orthodox community, uh, less so in the Haredi community, but you have many people with family in Israel. That's who's making Aliyah. The kids are going, uh, building lives there. They have children, they have grandchildren. There's a much greater sensitivity so that when there's an attack on Israel, they're checking to see if their kids are okay. Um, and that gives you a different perspective. You know, I was talking to an academic who said, uh, um, actually it wasn't an academic, it was a, a, a woman, strongly identifies Jew, as a Jew, but very much from the left. And she said, they should try the one state solution. And I said, you know, and sitting in her penthouse on the Upper East Side, <laughs> you know, 
I said, that's very nice of you to propose here, but you know, and in, for, the, for this community, it's my kids who are there, you know? Yeah. So I think there's, there's that divide, and, 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 but also that feeling of having been burnt by the left and, and the refusal of other Jews to recognize that anti-Semitism on the left. Look, as, as, as you know from reading the book, that I make the argument that there's, we're living in a perfect storm right now of yeah. anti-Semitism. There's anti-Semitism on the right, Charlottesville, uh, Pittsburgh, in fact, if you, I was just in a briefing of someone was giving who, who was uh, um, bringing us uh, FBI and, and Ho Department of Homeland Security statistics, and in America, the attacks they fear from the right, from lone wolves like the Pittsburgh uh, guy, who are harder to track because they're not following someone, they're not part of a group. That's, they fear that from the right. Um, in Arkansas, and in, the, in a small college town, they discovered a, a hotbed of Ku Klux Klaners and, and uh, white supremacist terrorists. Um, so we see it on the right. We certainly see it on the left. Anybody who doesn't see it on the left is, is just being blind. We see it from Islamist extremists, um, and I don't know whether to put them on the right or the left. They, I think they preclude that. that and we also see it sadly, and I say this sadly, I'm part of a Muslim Jewish advisory group you know, that's working against hate on, for hate laws, for hate laws and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we also see it in segments, particularly in Europe, but not only, of the Muslim community sectors. I, I wanna be very careful here, not, and I don't wanna speak broadly, um, where anti-Semitism has become so wrapped up in the dialogue against Israel. Um, and so we have this perfect storm, and then we have, within the Jewish community, and not just the Jewish community, people on the right who don't see it around them at all, and oh, he didn't mean it when he said nice people on both sides, you know, nice people don't march with swastikas, uh, and swastika-like things, chanting Jews will not replace us. He didn't really mean it, it's not, you know, those, they ignore the dog whistles. And we have people on the left who are quick to see it on the right, mm -hmm. but don't see it next to them. Right. Um, and when, when that happens, I call that weaponizing, of political weaponizing of anti-Semitism. And I have to ask, if you only see it on the other side of the political transom from where you're located, <laughs> are you really concerned about defeating anti-Semitism or are you more concerned about making political points? And I think that's a lot of what we're seeing. I want people to fight what's right next to them. Because that's also where you have your most street cred, you know, your credibility. Um, but we're seeing this opposite kind of thing. Right, right, right. Um, you write in the book that uh, Trump is probably, probably not an anti-Semite, although enabling anti-Semites is itself an anti-Semitic right. act. And I think that that's very right. And there are acts, there are anti-Semitic acts of commission, and there are anti-Semitic acts of omission. And I just want to give one example of the latter. Um, it's interesting that other than the Treasury Secretary, Mnuchin, uh, not one Jew has been appointed to a cabinet position. Uh, this is the most Judenrein cabinet <laughs> in ages, in decades, and it's further compounded by the fact that the first Be thankful for little things. No, 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 I'm not, <laughs> you know. That was a joke, it was a joke. Yeah. As a Jew, I can complain and not complain <laughs> at the same time. And you do it very and well. And do it elegantly, <laughs> exactly, thank you. Um, and then Gary Cohen, this compounds it actually, was made director of the White House National Economic Council. So what's he done with these two, two Jews, but Cohen Economics. was not a case. He's put them in charge of the money. That's what he's done. It is a sort of racial profiling. And it's not an accident. Remember years ago in an interview, he was talking about one of his casinos and he said that he didn't want a black guy in charge of his money at his casinos. Instead he wanted, and I'm quoting, a short Jewish guy with a yarmulke. <laughs> well, they, never, they don't wear yarmulkes, and Mnuchin certainly not, but nonetheless, that's, that's what he's done. So they're acts of, uh, commission and omission. So you preempted what I wanted to talk about next, but there may be, we may be able to draw a little bit more, and that is on the left. That is the situation on the left. Um, 
British Jews supported the Labour Party to a considerable Bruce, it was extent. Their home. It was their uh -huh. home for yeah. generations. That has completely been, I mean, almost completely been eradicated. In, in three years. Yeah, absolutely. So is there a cautionary tale here? I think there might be. Um, people talk about a generational divide in the Democratic Party today. I think it's also an ideolo more ideological. It happens to be presenting generationally, but I also think it's ideological. And, um, you know, Corbyn, uh, just to go back to something you quoted, I don't know if Trump is an anti Semite. I tend to doubt it. I think he's more concerned about Trump than any. No, no, I mean, I mean that seriously. I don't know if. Uh, Trump is an anti-Semite. I don't know if Corbyn is an anti-Semite. I have to think he is, but I don't know. Um, and I also think that's the wrong question to ask, because if you ask that question, you get tied up. He is an anti-Semite. He isn't. An I don't give a damn whether he is or he isn't. What I want to know is what they do. Right. And that's why I have that in that category where I talk about anti-Semitic enablers where the person themselves may not be an anti-Semite, but they use anti-Semitism to whip up their supporters. So, you're good because you've, again, preempted. So what Well, that, your questions are very good, because no. I'm, you know. <laughs> I hope my mother's watching. Um, <laughs> so, you, li you explained for your two interlocutors, Abigail, the, the Jewish undergraduate, and mm -hmm. Joe, the non-Jewish professor of law, um, different kinds of anti-Semites. And this is a way of bringing them all together because in the um, four categories, we have both left, what could be termed left wing and right, right wing. wing. So I'm gonna get you to speak about them. So the first category is, of course, the extremist. Mm -hmm. So can you say something about the that? The extremist is the one we all know, and everybody hates the extremist. The extremist is the uh, you know, person marching down the street crying, Jews will not replace us, but doing it in an SS-like uniform. Uh, we all hate the extremists. It's the, the racist equivalent of the Ku Klux Klan right. person. Um, and we all, and you don't dress up in Ku Klux Klan uniforms even when you're graduating from medical school. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, or put on blackface or whatever yeah. it is. Um, the extremists, everybody hates the extremists. Right. That's the Hitlerian, but that's the easy one to hate. Move a little further away, you have my second category is what I call the dinner party anti-Semite. In the German edition they call, of the book, they call it the Salon anti-Semite. Right. The person who would never harm anyone, but who sits down at, the, at a dinner party or a restaurant with friends and he says, oh, my firm just hired a nice young Jewish associate. He's really smart, but he's really honest. You know, or uh, even a pro, you know, a, a philo Semite, someone who loves uh, uh, Jews or claims to love Jews, like, well, or Trump says, I want a short Jewish accountant with a yarmulke. Uh, I think it was Frank Foyer, the journalist, yep. who said a philo Semite is an anti Semite who likes Jews. Right. You know? <laughs> Because of course, when that accountant screws up and doesn't, and you don't turn a profit, and he hasn't learned how to cook the books or the way you want it or something, you say, "Oh, that damn Jewish." I mean, then the good, you know, becomes the, the bad Jew, right? Yeah. Um, but so you have the dinner party anti-Semite. Um, it happened to me. One of the few incidences of anti-Semitism that I encountered was in my first job at the University of Washington in Seattle. I was the first professor ever of I was in the history department, Jewish history, but the first professor at the university, Jewish anything, appended to the title. And uh, after being there, it was a wonderful history department, after being there for about eight months, a colleague said, Deborah, let's go get some coffee. So I went to have coffee, and he said to me, I have to tell you that when I heard you were getting the job, you, a woman from New York, a Jew, I was really nervous. I didn't know what we were getting, but you are terrific. You're the best hire we've made in the department. Now that was, I was a young, I was fresh out of graduate school, just finished my dissertation. This guy was tenured senior. I just sat there. Now I wouldn't be quiet, you know. <laughs> uh, but um, 
it was, I, I didn't know what to say. Yeah. That's, that's the dinner party anti-Semite. Yeah. You have the anti-Semitic enabler, and in that sense, I put Trump and Corbyn and look at both of them, because um, I say, I think they both are enablers. They use anti-Semitism to win over their base, one on the left, one on the right. And then you have the clueless yeah. anti-Semite. Yeah. Um, uh, a friend of mine was graduating from nursing school many years ago, went to, Col I think it was Columbia, she went to a very fine nursing school, and her sweet mates or her working group together, they were divided into groups, were three or four women from the Midwest who had never really interacted with Jews in their life. She, my friend was from New York, so her family began to invite these girls for Friday night dinner, to come to Purim, Hanukkah parties, they, and they really adopted them, and, the, and they loved it. They became part of the family. The group was having its uh, farewell dinner at time of graduation or farewell lunch. They went out to lunch together, and they were talking about things that they would miss in New York, and one of them, and they, and one of them said, oh, what I'm gonna miss is, is this places to get bargains. And I just found this great new store. I'm um, sorry, I only found it at the end of our, our years together at, at, at nursing school. And she turned to my friend, the only Jew at the table, and said, you're really gonna wanna know about this place. You know, uh, that's, but she was clueless to that. She had no, and my friend, who's quick, you know, usually we think of the retort at two o'clock in the morning, we sit up, and <laughs> that's what I should have said. My friend was quick enough to say, I didn't know Jews were the only ones smart enough to try to save their hard-earned money. <laughs> and the girl got it. Sometimes you don't realize. I mean, I, it's hard to imagine that someone who uses the term, I Jewed him down, doesn't realize how anti-Semitic there is, but I think there are people like that. And, and I think that you know, we have to be conscious of that as well. But to differentiate, to look at it in a nuanced way, and not to say one is worse or one is better, but just to understand the different places people are coming from. We have time for one more question from me. Um, one of the virtues of this book um, and there are many, but one of them is this very broad spectrum uh, approach that Deborah takes. And you get an incredibly good sense by the time you finish reading it of this whole panoply of anti-Semitic genres, tropes, and sentiments that are in current circulation. And they're all disturbing, uh, but it seems to me that some might be more urgent than others that need to be addressed. And I wonder if you agree with that, and where do you see the biggest threats coming from? I'll tell you, in two places. Not from the clueless anti semitic Yeah, right, obviously. no, no, yeah. no, the, the two areas. First of all, and it, it's, it's almost, I mean, I'm sure it'll come up in the questions, but the complicated way in which Israel has been drawn into this and Israel's become part of it in a way that the anti-Semite uses anti-Semitic tropes to attack Israel, um, and, and the anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, gets all mixed up one with the other. I think that's a very troubling thing, but even more troubling than that. You know what really scares me? Um, and that's the last chapter where I talk about less oi, more joy, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but I, I say it in all due seriousness. I, I write to Abigail at the very end in my final letter, she's about to graduate. And these are two made up characters, but everything they ask me are things that I've been asked by students or by colleagues or by parents or by whatever. It's, so it's two fictional characters speaking the truth. Um, and. I, I, I say to her, you know, I'm, I'm really glad, and I've had this conversation with students who, who've been about to graduate, um, that I'm, I'm really touched by her concern and her interest in, and her willingness to delve into this ugly topic. But I worry that the leitmotif, the theme of her Jewish identity will become anti-Semitism or fighting anti-Semitism. And not that she shouldn't be fighting it, but that it will be Jew as object, not Jew as subject. Mm -hmm. What is done to Jews as opposed to what Jews do. And, and, and that worries me that that becomes the theme or the other option, and we've already seen this in certain areas on campus, to borrow a, a phrase from another form of prejudice of Jews going back into the closet. I'm gonna be four years on campus. I'm not gonna identify as a Jew. I'm not gonna join Hillel. I'm not gonna to go to Jewish events. 
I don't want to spend four years fighting, defending, or we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take the mezuzah off the front door, or we're gonna not carry the bag that says Jewish Film Festival or whatever it might be. Um, that that after so many decades, and you've seen it in your community, I mean, par excellence in, in the Bay Area, of Jews coming out and celebrating and, and lifting up that identity, that it'll be pushed down. Mm -hmm. And um, I worry about both those things. I, I, I end the book, and maybe before we go to questions, with this anecdote, as you know, of uh, walking into my synagogue uh, a couple of years ago with two friends, a mother and her five-year-old daughter, and I'm equally friends with both of them, with the, five, with the five-year-old, she's now six. I read every night, and we, um, and we walked into synagogue well before Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and uh, the mother said to the little girl, Shy, say thank you to the police officer who was standing at the entrance for keeping us safe. And Shy looked at her mother with total confusion because she knows about safe places and unsafe places. We read books about that. We read Roald Dahl. You know, we don't buy his books. He was an anti-Semite. We, <laughs> we only take him out of the library. Um, but but um, she knows about unsafe places. But to her, Shul Synagogue is a happy place. She goes in the morning, on Saturday mornings, her parents go into the sanctuary, she peels off and goes to this giant concrete area we have where the kids are running around like maniacs, and this wonderful playground we have in behind the shul, and then at some point they're ushered into children's services where they sing songs and get snacks and play games, um, and then comes the end of the service. They're brought into the main sanctuary where they lead the, the singing of Adon Olam. And then they get lollipops from the rabbi. And then they go to the Kiddush. Now, you can have 200 people, 250 people in the room where the Kiddush is. Now, how many of you would go into a room with 250 people with your children or your grandchildren and not say to them, now stay close, I want you to... S but they don't. They run around, they can go anywhere. Nobody's nervous because everybody's watching and everybody knows it's a safe place. So they're free to eat chips and cookies and olives and, <laughs> and avoid anything resembling protein, you know? Um, <laughs> And then they go home, and she's had three, three and a half hours of pure happiness. Now here's her mother telling her, thank the guard for keeping us safe. Why do I need to have to be safe at the synagogue? But we know she does. And we know she's gonna be old enough soon to look across the street at the big church across the street and see there are no guards there. Or she goes to a Jewish school to know that when her carpool pulls up at the Jewish school, the, there's a gate and the officer is there and he checks the carpool number, makes sure it's the right people, and he looks inside and then they go inside. She'll visit another school and she sees that's not standard operating procedure for every school. Mm. And, and my fear is that that happy place will be subsumed by the, by the difficulties. And, and that's what worries me most of all, because mm -hmm. even though I work, I've worked on the Holocaust, I, I write about it, I've <laughs> fought it, you know, I, deniers and other things like that, I'm very happy in my Jewish identity, and I'm very, it, it's, 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 it's who I am as much as a, as a woman, I mean, it's, it's an integral part of my being. Mm -hmm. And to make that something that becomes something that has to be protected or, and, and subject to attack, would be a great loss, and, yeah. and that worries me a lot. Yeah, yeah. The technical term is it's in your kishkas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Kishkas, that's right. Kishka Judaism, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to take some questions. I just want to say, you know, all of Deborah's books are, uh, have one quality, or they have many qualities, but one quality is that there's a tremendous amount of courage in the way you practice history and the sorts of things that you write Thank about. You. And uh, you, uh, you uh, encourage Abigail at the end uh, with uh, a quote from Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and of good courage, Chazak uh, uh, which was the uh, motto of the school I went to in Australia. Oh, well then, all the So more. if they're still watching, it rang, uh, it rang very true to me. <laughs> no, it's, it's a big, fight the good fight, but rejoice in who you are. And I think that that's exactly how you live and uh, as a person and as a historian Thank as well. Thank you very much, John. Thank so you. the floor is open. Yep, over here on the left. 
but happily I'm not in charge of this. So, okay, so we up there. Someone uh, else is. Thank <laughs> you for your discussion tonight. I certainly believe that you understand the importance of names and titles. Right now, I believe the media is not doing a good job of calling these groups what they should be called. I, I don't believe that they should, use, for example, use white nationalist. I think they should call them white extremists or white hate groups or whatever. They, they should be more honest and not glorify because these people call themselves white nationalists right proudly. Mm -hmm. And so I think the media needs to do a better job of really taking these people to task. And, and I'm, I feel the same way about the far right. I mean, you, you know, it's, it's right versus wrong. They should call them religious extremists or religious fanatics. What do you feel about I that? Think it, no, I think it's a good point. I mean, they, they, white nationalism, I mean, I think we, most of us know what white nationalism is, but white supremacy captures it much better. Um, look, but we have a member of Congress who, who wondered what was wrong with the term white supremacy, so. Uh, you know, it's, it's there, even, even in that term, people are, are sort of sanitizing it, but, but I think it's, it's a good point. But in fact, it, it still leaves Jews out. That's the yes, problem. Yes, that's the problem. Because the opposite of, of white is black. That's right. And so therefore, it's just assumed, and especially, and it's understandable with America's terrible history of racism, that it only refers, that, that the opposite of white nationalism would be sort of you know, hatred of African Americans. Right. But that leaves Jews out in the cold, and it leaves anti-Semitism not taken care of, and it is at the core of their ideology. That's right. It's not peripheral, it's not it is central. Exactly. It is central. And the other thing that happens is that blacks say, oh, you see, when they're talking about, even the Jews want to glomp on to the hatred of blacks. Right. You know, and, and it's, it's crazy, but that, that's also what happens. But, but white supremacists, do not look at you as white and see you as manipulating the others who are even more less white. Correct. We have a question here down in the front. Uh, Elon Omar has obviously been thrust into the headline and I was wondering in your scheme of classification, uh, how would you dis describe her? And for, question for both of you. And furthermore, is there any legitimacy in, at all in some of the things that she raises vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the criticism of Israel, uh, or is it purely conflating it with anti-Semitism? She didn't criticize Israel. There was nothing in her comments. Uh, hip, well, she talked about hypnotizing, uh, but Israel has hypnotized the rest of the world. So there was something, but she wasn't criticizing Israeli policies. She talked, it's all about the Benjamin's baby. That's our money that we're supposedly giving and, and using to get people to support um, Israel and then dual allegiance, allegiance to a foreign country. She was talking about American Jews. She was talking about American supporters of Israel. So um, to my mind, I mean, she has apologized more than once um, but at least that's more than some others have done, so you know that's to be acknowledged at least. But um, we can have a really good discussion, criticism of Israeli policies, and there are good discussions. But that's what it was, and and the dual allegiance thing. Um, that's you know Jews. That's that's central to the anti-Semitic stereotyping. Anti-Semitic stereotyping has three elements: money power, and smarts, but all used in a conniving, malicious kind of, nefarious kind of way. And that's when, that's why the, the Soros character or the Rothschild, you can't quite spot them, and you can't quite figure out what they're doing, or the Jews will not replace us, but they're back there, up there, manipulating and orchestrating. Um, and that played right into that comment. So, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it certainly has gotten her lots of attention and lots of support and criticism. I would just say, can I just add one thing, is that, you know, anti-Semitism is unique among prejudices in one way. Most prejudices are directed uh, by one group towards another group that they consider inferior. 
What's different about anti-Semitism right. is that the, they consider the Jews superior, and therefore it has to be a... No. No, it's not. No, it's it's not. actually it's not. superior in an evil way. That and so consequently, uh, and you can go back to, you know, even Martin Luther said this already in the 16th century, and he referred to, uh, he referred to Germans as we dumb goyim allow them to take advantage of us. That's right. That they control the country. And of course, when you get to a genocidal regime like the Nazis, and there's much in between, of course, it then becomes, because you consider that group dangerously superior, it becomes the only response to save yourself is, is a genocidal that's response. Right. That's right. That is different. That is, that is what is different. So the, the, considering Jews smarter, cleverer, in an evil in way, an evil way, with evil abilities, doesn't really have an analogy, an analog in, right. in, with, other, right. with other groups. That's right. That's right. That's uh, Soros, Rothschild. Uh, you know, did, have you ever saw um, Yud Zeus? Uh, the, the Nazis hated hated the Gypsies, but you never hear of a, a world Gypsy conspiracy. That's right. Only the Jews are smart enough yeah. and evil enough to create this conspiracy to stab us in the back. So it's it's Precisely. that. that guy. Next question here on the left. Okay. I'd like to hear your thoughts about Pittsburgh and how to heal from it. I have a friend who was shot that day and I'm still grieving. You want to hear my thoughts about Pittsburgh? And how to, and, and how to heal from it. <sighs> you know, uh, I, I, you, you have a friend who was shot and you're still grieving just last week at a meeting of the Covenant Foundation. I met. Uh, the daughter-in-law of one of the women who was killed, the Joyce, I'm blocking on her last name, she's 76, she was a scientist, she was a, a scientist at the, I think, Pittsburgh Medical School. Um, and her pain was still palpable. I, I, I think it would be chutzpah on my part to tell you how to heal. Um, and I, I don't want to find anything good in such a horrible incident, but maybe a little bit of bomb to all our wounds, but especially on a personal level to those who feel it so personally as, as you do, is to look at the response, to look at the reaction. For, for a good week, every news show was talking about it. Mm -hmm. Everyone was shocked. Um, you saw Jews of all uh, background stripes, non-Jews, you know, I'm sure if I asked how many people went to shul the following Shabbat who don't usually go to shul, I mean, it, the shuls were packed, synagogues were packed with Jews, with non-Jews. And a large amount of money collected by a Muslim group. Muslim right? groups, money collected to help to, to, to all sorts of ways. So does that mitigate your pain? Not by an iota because a friend was hurt. And does it mitigate the, the pain of the, the young woman I met last week who lost her mother-in-law? As soon as they heard, they started to call and call, no answer. They figured maybe she was hurt, and they just got in their car and drove down. And uh, by 1 o'clock in the morning, they knew. Um, but she, her pain was, was clear, was on the surface. Um, but, but there was a world reaction. There was a world outrage. There was shock that this could happen. Um, I was shocked. I wasn't surprised. I told this to the Times. I wasn't surprised. I was, I was shocked, but I wasn't surprised. Um, and, and one of the things that, I, one of the ways, and it gets a little off Pittsburgh, but to think about anti-Semitism is like, uh, and this is a disgusting description, but it is a disgusting thing, um, is like a herpes virus. You know, until recently, now I think there's medication that can cure you from herpes, but if you got that virus, it was always in you. And we've all heard the horror stories of the bride who wakes up on the morning of her wedding with a cold sore or someone going for a, um, a job interview and suddenly gets an outbreak because it comes out when there's tension. Anti-Semitism is like herpes. It's in the, it's in the it's fabric. It's yeah. exactly what you were saying before. It's in the fabric. It's in the fabric of religion. 
It's in the fabric of, you know, it starts in, in, with the New Testament depiction of the death of Jesus. It, it, it's built up on in the Middle Ages, as, as your work so, shows so clearly. It migrates into the secular world through uh, Karl Marx and before that through Voltaire. Mm -hmm. uh, it's adapted by Martin Luther earlier. Um, it moves into the, the pseudo-scientific realm. It, it's there and it comes out at moments of tension. Not, I shouldn't say it comes out because that sound, sounds passive. It is brought out, it is enabled, it is used, and it's in the society in a very strong fashion. Mm. Okay, Becky, we're, we're gonna take two more questions. Okay. Question down here in the front. Okay. Hi, um, with a historical tip of the hat to Max Weinreich's his, Hitler's professors, and just, my, my question is to ask you to please contextualize, just raw, because you, you've, you've done a typology of, you know, this anti uh -huh. uh, Raw opportunism, people that really, you know, until you find out that, like, hey, I can really do a good business, if you have a clientele, suddenly you, you change the nature of your restaurant and you offer alcoholic beverages or you do this, just, opportunistic anti-Semitism. You've had Jewish colleagues in the academy, as Weinreich talked about. They've, they've been your friends. You've, you've watched each other's kids. And now it's just, it's just good business. Well, look, Heidegger, um, as rector of the university, forbid his mentor, an o older, <laughs> outstanding thinker, philosopher, to come and use the library because now he was the rector under the Nazis. So, you know, people, people will glomp onto it in a, and, and they will find ways of justifying it. Um, and My question is how afraid of that? I, am, I see it, I see it. I see it certainly on, on, on the left, but also on the right. I mean, look, Viktor Orban. Viktor Orban, who studied on a Soros fellowship at Oxford then uses the imagery of Soros as a way of, you know, and, and, uh, uh, it, and he used, uh, I, I, I was in Sweden a couple of weeks ago as a guest of the government for, their, for Holocaust Remembrance Day, and I spoke about the Orban phenomenon, and there was a, this, the number two person at the Hungarian embassy was there, and he came up to me and said, you're wrong, it's only about immigrants. But if you look at the imagery, it's not about immigrants. What's sad with the Soros thing, and this goes back to the right and the left, yeah. Soros is a critic of Israel, Soros is very much a man of the left. So I have had people say to me, Jews, but he was a Nazi. <laughs> and I say, excuse me, he's 88. How old was he in, during, while the, while the, when the Nazi, when the, uh, the Germans were in Hungary and the Holocaust was going to Hungary? 13 years old, 13 and 14. He was no Nazi, he was hidden. It, his father was very resourceful and hid members of the family in non -Jewish, with non-Jews. The non-Jew he was with was a bureaucrat who had to go and collect the furniture of Jews. And, and in fact, Soros describes that day when and he took Soros with him, George with him, um, that he couldn't pee. He was afraid to pee because someone would see that he was circumcised. But we, we absorb this kind of stuff. And so it's... it's, it's you don't have to go to Hungary. I mean, you know, in terms of opportunism, you can stay right here in California with, with Kevin McCarthy. That's right. And his tweet, mm -hmm. right, about Soros, about Steyer, and about Bloomberg. Buying the election. Buying the election. Right. Okay, we're okay. going to take one last question over here on the left. A reminder to everybody that Deborah Lipstadt is going to be signing books immediately after in the atrium. Please stick around for that. Last question. So I wanted to offer a couple of comments that come from my experience. I was born in 1946 in Poland. My parents were Holocaust survivors. And what I learned from Poland is the following, that the main class of anti-Semites are denigrators. They are much more powerful and speak a lot more than the salon or dinner party uh, type of anti-Semites. And basically, the way that Jews have been looked at in Poland, is they're smart, they're clever, they're industrious, but they are somewhat subhuman. They are vermin, they are rats. So they are not really thought of as superior. They have certain <laughs> superior qualities, but they really are subhuman, which is why they can be exterminated. Uh, the other lesson that I learned that is particularly important, I think, given what is happening right now, 
is that in 1968 and March of 1968, 51 years ago, the government started an anti-Zionist campaign, right. which very rapidly turned into anti-Semitic campaign, and by eight months later, our family had to leave. And that's despite the fact that my family's ancestors had lived in Poland for 600 or 800 years, right. we were forced to leave. Right. What I see right now that is happening, especially coming from the Democratic Party right now, is that kind of what in Poland was called Nagonka. It's not a pogrom, it's not a massacre, but it's creating distrust, suspicion, stigmatization. We can put a police officer in front of a synagogue. We cannot police put a police officer anywhere in front of that kind of vile stigmatization. Right. That grows like a fire in a dry forest. Okay, let me get, the, you make three points and I'm gonna try to get to all of them. On the superior, inferior, I don't wanna get caught up in semantics, but, but if you compare it to, the, I'm just trying to differentiate here. If you compare to how the white supremacist, the racist, looks at the person of color, we can't have them in, what did, what did Representative King say? You can't build your future on the backs of brown babies or right. things like that. They, they're lower, they're gonna bring you down. How did the Nazis explain Jesse Owens' incredible uh, athletic feat, and you can do, spell it F-E-E-T or F-E-A-T, you know, <laughs> at the 1936 Olympics by saying, oh, on the genetic charge, chart, a black man from Africa, whose roots are in Africa, is closer to an animal than a human, and no, even the best Aryan racer couldn't beat a, a, a horse. So it's seen as less. The Jew is a danger because they're conniving. They have this power. They do things, they control things. Look, they managed to get the Romans to crucify Jesus. The Romans, the main power in the universe at the time. Even though the Romans didn't want to do it, they said crucify him and the Romans did it. Or the deniers, they, they got the allies to plant uh, false evidence and they got the Germans to admit to this crime for their own purposes. So that's where that superior thinks in an evil sort of way. On, um, what was your, the second point on the uh, 1968? Yeah, what I was saying, that what I see in the atmosphere. Yeah, um, and the anti, for, Look, the whole campaign against an the anti-Zionist campaign as we see it today has its roots in the Soviet Union, the late unlamented Soviet Union. Um, but they started with, ant their anti-Zionism campaign was absolutely an anti-Semitic campaign. Um, and what happened in Poland, and there was a, I don't know if you saw the exhibit in Poline uh, last year on 1968, which was just amazing, the, the Jewish Museum in, in, in Warsaw, um, was clearly an anti-Semitic attack. Um, that, that we're seeing that in the Democratic Party, I, I think that's going too far at this point. We are seeing that certainly on the progressive left, um, and there are people who are fighting against it, but I think to immediately start labeling everyone like that is to, is to give up the, we're at the beginning of right. that fight. And it can be fought. It must be, whether you're on the right or the left, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, it must be fought. But it's not gonna be fought by statements like the Democratic Party hates Jews or things like that. It's gonna be fought from within, but it's gotta be challenged. But again, I want to emphasize the need to not turn this into the weaponization of anti-Semitism. If you do that, the only people you will give nachas to, happiness to, are the anti-Semites. You know, and I think on top of that, and maybe, maybe to close with this, to go back to the point I was making at the very end, above all, and I'm sitting here in a, in a place which is a, a, a vibrating institution of Jewish life and learning and, and celebration of arts, all forms of Jewish tradition, you know, religious, secular, artistic, uh, political, literary, et cetera, et cetera, um, 
that above all, we can't make this the, the beat of the drummer to which we, our Jewish lives right. march. If we do that, then we really will have allowed the anti-Semite to, to succeed. And um, we've got something, it's not that I want to only, do, don't do it because you don't want to give the anti-Semite the pleasure, but you have something so precious that is part of our Jewish, we have something so precious that is part of our Jewish heritage that it deserves much more than just being turned into a defensive mechanism. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.